Okay, right. We're going now to something that um, I'm going to find very interesting. This is around about cyber security and competitive gaming. Um, and we've got Alex Postby Child and David Balfo from JISC who are going to come and talk to us um, about issues around cyber security if you're considering hosting or participating in esports event. Then some, you know, some sensible steps and tips um, to keeping uh, you, your institution, your organization cyber secure. So, um, no further ado, welcome, guys. It's all yours. Thank you very much. Um, so, my name's Alex Postbuchild, um, and I'm here with David to give you a quick, uh, very high level overview of cyber security and how it can be sort of transposed into a competitive gaming scene. I uh, just introduced myself. I'm David Batho. I'm the Senior Security Specialist at JISC. Uh, so I cover penetration testing, uh, information security, and uh, national incident responses uh, around the UK. And uh, I'm Alex Postbuchard. Uh, I also work for JISC. I am a penetration tester, and I've been doing it for uh, just over a year, uh, working with David to do penetration tests on a on, uh, mostly educational sector. So to kick off with our first section, uh, we're going to be having a look at DDoS attacks. Um, now, what are DDoS attacks? Why do people do it? Um, why are they there? And what are some ways to try and mitigate the effects of a DDoS attack or recover from them? So, what, so firstly, what is a DDoS attack? Well, DDoS stands for Distributed Denial of Service. It is essentially hundreds or thousands of machines sending requests to a service or a, you know, a vulnerable uh, server to shut it down um, and basically stop it from performing that action or the action that it's trying to do. Uh, this can be done in quite a few ways, but the most common way is actually something called SIN flooding. Um, the picture we have on the right there is just from a service in 2016 was DDoSed. And this is a live map that was showing all of the connections hitting that one service just to bring it down, take it offline so that no one else can access it. So how does it work? Um, in short, you can have a person or group. Um, I'm sure you've heard quite a lot about groups of uh, hackers at the moment. And they essentially infect machines or um, have servers, cloud infrastructure that they are in control of that could potentially have malware on. And they control all of these machines through something called a bot controller, which has a, a C2 server on it or command and control server. Um, and what they can essentially do is take, these, uh, take a request, send it to a machine, and that machine will send it off to all of the hundreds thousands of machines that they have control of, and they will all carry out the same action wherever it's pointed. So uh, in this instance, uh, you know, a DDoS attack, they find a vulnerable service and just hit it with thousands of machines constantly until it stops working. Um, the problem with DDoS attacks is that they are quite easy to get hold of for people that don't have their own botnets, the people that don't have the teams of hackers that are setting up these botnets. There are ways to stress test networks, and they are quite publicly available. There, there was also um, open source software that could allow you to try and uh, denial of service uh, your friends for a joke, for example. Um, and it's been taken very, you know, very far in certain ways and has been caused to take out services. Uh, like the picture on the right there, the uh, low-orbit ion cannon was a fun open-source tool that you could use to sort of zap your friends, and people uh, sort of misused it and uh, taken it to another level. So that's all well and good, but how do you sort of protect yourself from a DDoS attack? Well, first of all, you probably want to find out what people are going to attack. Uh, why they're going to attack it, and you know, if it was attacked with a DDoS attack, 
what would you lose at that time? You know, um, what service would go down? What could people effectively gain from bringing that service down? Um, and moving into the sort of mitigation, you can set up protection services. There are certain services that are available. JISC offer a service as well um, that can help mitigate these attacks. Um, and you can also plan. You can plan uh, and create a playbook for how to deal with these attacks. Um, what, what should happen when an attack happens and you are the target? You know, how do you recover from that? As I said, it's very, a very um, high-level overview of, uh, of all of this stuff. There, we could talk for hours on these subjects. Um, but here's a, here's a fun one um, that I thought I'd bring to the presentation. Cybersecurity isn't purely around hardware or around, um, you know, the sort of people being hackers and getting into your machine and to stop your competitions. It can be anywhere. Malware is, is a thing. It, it can it not cannot strictly be about certain pieces of software or going to weird dodgy websites and uh, having an effect. It could be something that you've installed yourself with all good intention that is being misused by someone else. So some of these uh, applications that you may be able to see uh, in front of you are used for for gaming. There's a lot of uh, certain third-party mod managers. Um, Add-ons for games that um, you know can be used within the games that ha have community input into them. So, for example, um, We Cores on the right is a very, very, very popular World of Warcraft add-on that allows you to have um, scripting within your game. But you can also get these scripts from certain people. And how do you know what they've put in there? Um, how do you know that they, you know, it's not intentionally there to be misused? Well. Uh, this uh, this person is a um, is a streamer, and he found out the hard way that when he was playing uh, World of Warcraft with Weekors, he uh, blindly accepted someone's mod or add-on. Um, he walked over to his mailbox as he was told to do, and it instantly delivered all of his in-game gold to the person who wrote the the code, and he stole all of his gold from him, which uh, was quite funny to watch at the time. But obviously, he didn't enjoy it happening. Another thing that can in non uh, something that may not be intentional from your side is agreeing to certain terms and conditions that you may actually not agree to. One of the uh, biggest lies on the internet is yes, I agree to the terms and conditions. Uh, how many of you have actually sat and read through the terms and conditions without actually just pressing OK? Um, as you can see here on the screen, this is actually taken from a third-party mod manager for um, quite a lot of games. It's actually taking over quite a lot of uh, mods for games. And this was their terms and conditions before they altered them to look so menacing. Um, as you can see, if you purchase stuff, we'll take your name, email address, postal address. Um, they also want to take your IP address of your machine, the operating system that you have, the browser that it uses, the search engines that you use, uh, any URL, uh, URLs or websites that you visit, uh, telemetry where you currently are, and you know you're agreeing to this, and they will use that uh, information to send to third parties to send you targeted ads and um, advertising, and they will have uh, basically a record of who you are just because you want to update your games. So how do you protect yourself from these sort of things? Um, quick suggestion. If you intend on having add-ons or mods or anything like that for the games that you may be playing, it might be an idea to have a, a safe list if you can. Um, if you could have potentially someone look through the code of cert certain add-ons or go through and vet that these add-ons are safe and then have a sort of verified place to get these from, that would be a great step. Um, if you can, have a look through the code. Um, if you know what you're looking at or you don't, have a brief look through and see if it just looks odd. and Lastly, check the terms and conditions and make sure you actually are happy to agree to them. Sometimes they uh, are a little bit weird. Cool. Um, I'm going to do something that is really close to my heart. And that, as you're well aware, uh, nationally, uh, we've had a lot of um, breaches from universities and colleges uh, across the UK recently. And a lot of this is really comes down to one fundamental thing. It's the controls, the information security controls that govern the internal or the external infrastructure of your systems. 
So we talk about uh, antivirus, we talk about patching, and I can, I'm just going to go through, I've only got a few minutes, so I'm going to go as quickly as I can to go through information security. Normally this is about an hour, two hours, I normally talk about this kind of subject, but I'm going to try and do it in, in, in kind of as, as quick as possible. So I'm going to cover the, the CIA triad, which is, is kind of key to information security. I'm going to talk about network segregation. The reason I'm going to talk about segregation is it's really key to ensure that your gaming environment and your network is segregated appropriately for the network and the service it's running. The next part is to ensure that you have auditing and monitoring on that segment of the network uh, in order to identify threats. And then also about security requires controls to monitor and detect and protect your environment. So the first things first for me is the CIA triad, and I'm going to try and pull, hopefully this all works. So the CIA triad is based on information security principles that are confidentiality, integrity, and availability. This makes up the security framework. So where are we thinking about just being, oh, I've got a game, I'm going to install it and it's going out to internet and, and students are playing. There is more fundamental requirements around that. Confidentiality is preserving the authorized restriction to information, be that um, the game uh, information or anything like that. Need to know how much privileges do those students need on those machines in order to play the game. And also known as the, the least privileged principle, do they need to have full admin rights on the machine? So they don't introduce malware, they don't introduce ransomware into the architecture, so it's very key around that. Integrity is about ensuring the, uh, against problem with the environment. So if these students need greater privilege on these machines to play uh, World of Warcraft or, or League of Legends, that you're able to identify and ensure the integrity and the digital signature of these roles. Um, in, in, in the case of, of gaming, uh, separation of roles is not really required. It's very much kind of for the sysadmins. The availability, now we've kind of covered a lot of this. This is talking about mitigation and, and things like that. But ensuring that when you are gaming uh, and your students are very um, conscious of the latency on the network, ensure that you have the appropriate HA, make sure you've got uh, the appropriate network controls in place to ensure that you have availability of your, your, your core infrastructure. And what that does is ultimately give you the resiliency to your key gaming environment. These games, uh, League of Legends, and all, all of them are very latency-based and, and very sensitive on latency. Uh, and what you want to do is ensure that you, you reduce your mitigations against things like DDoS attacks, all that sort of stuff, and therefore ensuring that your assets, being the workstations and the games involved in it, are resilient to those environments. That is kind of the key, and what I'm trying to stress here is that the games are, are great, but make sure you've got the controls to protect the information gaming environment for these students. So from a threat actor, um, and I've been involved in probably all of the national incidents uh, across the UK, a lot of the, the incidents are, are related to network segregation. It is really crucial when you design game, gaming rooms or gaming environments to ensure that the network is segmented or segregated appropriately for that role. So for example, if it is a gaming room, and they need administrative privileges and they need certain controls in that environment, make it separated from your key core services. So make sure that it is separated and that you are monitoring uh, that. Segregation can be done in two, uh, two ways. It can be a virtual conf configuration or, or, or a physical separation network, and they can be going out different ways. It depends, but it's really key to think about network segregation as a whole. So one of the key things, um, I, I, and there's two things I do when I, I, I do uh, forensics and I, I, I do um, instant response, is really there's two things, backup and logs and events. So what I really want people to do is make sure they're able to capture and record security alerts within the environment. So you are able to determine what's happening on your network, be that a DDoS attack and active directories failure antivirus issues or, or somebody trying to make mods or configuration changes to your environment. It is really key to make sure you capture those. Be that in your segmented environment, that's really key. Ensure that you can identify threat intelligence. So this is looking at what's happening in the behavior of architecture. And that's really key for, for, for that kind of stuff. Then looking at, at key services that is that are used within your gaming environment. So uh, if that's Discord or anything like that, 
make sure that you're able to record the logs, maybe able to analyze those logs. And if there is an anomaly, uh, a behavioral change that you're kind of able to find and look at that. And the, the kind of last one where we see a lot of it is the lack of patch management, not just of, of the, the, the operating system underlying, but all the software that it requires to run. It needs to be regular and timely. We see a lot of failures in, in uh, environments where they don't patch and you land up in a situation that the, the environment is compromised. And, and that's, again, the same for a gaming environment. And that's why, again, we go back to segregation. We go back to looking at the core CIA triad of information security in order to protect your, your own key environment. So Brilliant. that's a very, very quick overrun of information security. Um, I can spend hours talking about information security and, and, and the architecture around it um, and how to, to put appropriate controls into protect your environment. But we had a very short time period, so I think I'm slightly overrun yeah. for kind of questions, but I hope. Uh, it kind of gives you a good overview. That was great. Uh, I think that gives the viewers um, a very headline into uh, how serious security has to be taken, but also that there is uh, a plethora of good advice uh, and resources available uh, through organisations like yourself, which um, can help institutions and organizations their sides uh, to do to, to do the things that that you know best practice that people like yourselves have spent your whole career figuring out and not learning all the time um, and I think yeah. it highlights you know to, to everybody that we're in a technical environment here um, and that's not to be feared you know we're, we're in a world of technology um, so the quicker everybody realizes that and and, it, and embraces it. Um, the better, yeah. because uh, we've talked today a lot about uh, transferable skills um, in our education. Uh, if ever there was a great example of what can happen if, you know, you learn some basics and have an interest, uh, you can end up doing talks and, and running, uh, you know, cybersecurity companies for a living. Uh, that's yeah. only going to get more important. Uh, and and more profitable because you, you, you guys have so much knowledge and experience to share, um, and it's vital. So, um, yeah. That was really, really, really helpful. Um, and I, what I'd like to make sure is that, that the viewers don't feel this is beyond them, you know, in terms of, all oh, this is all getting a bit technical and, oh, you know, dare I say, deep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and it is it's a difficult thing to make sort of <laughs> to make warm and fuzzy because it's not a warm and fuzzy uh, part of the business. Yeah. It's a very highly technical part of the business. Yeah, yeah if this is something that you definitely want to aim towards, um, you know, go for it. Uh, personally, I, I've spent, I don't know, I've spent the last, let's say, 13 years playing World of Warcraft for, you know, in ranges of 60 hours a week to, you know, 15 or so. And uh, I've work in the cybersecurity at the moment. Um, it's something that games have always been very close to my heart and IT as a whole has. And it's something that I've progressed towards. So, you know, if it's something that you also want to do or have a look at um, or get interested, anybody can do it. It's just something that you'd need to practice at for a bit. It's just like playing games. Cool. And I think this uh, we're just, just on time now. So thank you both. <laughs> I think it's for, for me that I would sum that up to say that's a really good insight into something that's absolutely essential for all organisations um, to embrace. But by no means is it, you know, it's dark arts, not at all. I'm listening to you two guys, it's not dark arts, it's just a lot of experience uh, clearly expressed um, to a high degree of uh, technical um, brilliance. So thank you both, really appreciate it.